several previous uh, speakers mentioned Sam's view that trainees are like candles uh, and we should uh, strive to uh, light them um, as their careers move forward. And the next part of our program is uh, organized by some of those uh, candles that Sam uh, lit. So I turn the program over at this point to Michelle James. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Norbert. I really appreciate that introduction. And um, I'll be kicking off the trainee session with Dr. Christina Zavaleta, who's an assistant professor at the University of Southern California in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Christina also did her postdoc uh, with Sam at the same time as Brian and I did. And yesterday, actually, we, as Sam's mentees, all got together uh, just to remember him, uh, which was really hard. And I wish we didn't have to come together for that reason. Uh, just like what Dr. Cherry was saying today, we all wish we didn't have to come together for this reason. But as hard as it was, it was, it was special and it was important to us. And we wanted to share a few things uh, from our time together yesterday, just because we thought it could give you a little more insight into Sam's lab and his, his academic family. And so we had about 60 people join, and I'm just showing you a few of the screenshots, the faces of his mentees uh, that all got on Zoom yesterday. And um, we'd love to see more of Sam's mentees next year, hopefully when we host this in person. And um, I know he considered so many people his mentees, um, collaborators, you don't have to have just been in his lab. So we'd love anyone and everyone to join us next year. And during our time together yesterday, we ran a poll because we, we all know how much Sam loved collecting all kinds of data. And we started by asking people, where are they calling in from? And um, as you can see here, most folk were zooming in from the US, but there was also a good number of countries uh, represented and even one person from another planet, which I know Sam would have found amusing. And next we asked folk, what country are you originally from? And I do want to note that this does not capture all of Sam's mentees. This is just the people that participated yesterday in this poll. But you can see, even from this relatively small survey, you can get an idea of the impact that Sam had by mentoring folk from all over the world. And that, that was something that we really loved about being in his lab, just how diverse and inclusive it was um, in terms of its makeup. And you can see here, there's folk originally from Tunisia, Bangladesh, India, South Korea, China, UK, Australia, Taiwan, Russia, Denmark, Netherlands, Germany, Canada, just to name a few. And Sam would often joke in lab meetings that he loved the fact that he could have a place to stay all over the world just through his trainees and staff and collaborators. That was something he was really proud of. Uh, next, we asked uh, if, if you, um, when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? And you can see here some very common themes that probably are not surprising. Um, you know, teacher, scientist, artist, um, you know, not surprising that these people are drawn to be in Sam's lab. Maybe more surprising is um, a pilot <laughs> as in Top Gun, but hey, it was there. And something that Sam really also um, took a lot of interest in, um, in for his mentees was he would always ask you what your talents were apart from science, apart from what you did in the lab. And he would, call on people uh, during barbecues that he would host to, to come and play the piano or at you know our radiology end of year parties he would have people from his lab come and um, sing or dance or play an instrument depending on what their talents were so you can see here most people online yesterday it was karaoke which was something we used to do together as a lab quite often and then this slide i think uh really does um show you just how dedicated people were and how loyal they were um, to being with Sam, how much they wanted to stay with him. And here on average, people that were participating in this poll indicated that they were with him for around four to eight years, which is pretty impressive, uh, especially given that, that most mentees um, here were postdocs and staff scientists and they didn't need to stay long, but they, they wanted to. And um, this is really a testament to the environment that Sam created and what a wonderful mentor he was. People wanted to be with him. And um, I can speak from personal experience. I, I remember saying to my mom and dad, I'll be back in three years. And I, they said, oh, that sounds like a long time. And I thought so too. But as soon as I got to Sam's lab, I, I felt immediately at home. And it's it's just been a life-changing experience and something that, that I never wanted to end. So I know a lot of people can relate to that. 
So probably the most special part of yesterday, at least for me, and I know for many others, was hearing from Sam's wonderful staff members. Uh, we heard from Elizabeth Gill, uh, the, who was Sam's right-hand woman uh, for so many years. And she was really uh, one of our lab moms as well. And um, Jim Stromer, who shared that he'd been with Sam for 25 years. It, um, he took a job with Sam straight out of college. And uh, I think it was him and also uh, Wei and Billy and others all shared that something they, they loved about Sam and were impressed um, by immediately was that they, they gave, um, he gave them all chances um, despite um, their, their backgrounds. He, he would give everyone wonderful opportunities and that every one of these people just shared um, really beautiful stories about the impact he had on them. And you've, you've heard so many times today, he just cared deeply about people. He would know all about everyone's families. And um, I think it's been really hard for people to move on and get other jobs because everyone's comparing their next boss or you know, trying to find jobs and, and thinking about Sam because there just really is no comparison. And it was lovely to hear these stories of their memories. And also we heard from mentees, uh, prime mentees that shared about their research and you know, what they're doing now, how Sam inspired them. We heard uh, from people that were with Sam from the early days at UCLA that stayed with him for quite some time, like Preetha Ray and uh, Ian Chen, Abhijit. And then we also heard from people that uh, weren't even in Sam's lab directly, like Adam Schuhendler, who um, crossed paths with him many times in MIPS but felt like he was one of his mentees because he would be advised by Sam and that had a great impact on him. And uh, lastly, we didn't just hear about people's research, but really more about all of the memories of just times with Sam outside the lab and how much he cared about each individual, the sorts of things we would do together uh, at conferences. I remember he took us all to a theme park one year and he loved roller coasters. So we would, um, you know, we were just sharing about all of those memories and how much we're going to miss him. Uh, many people shared that he gave them this book at the helm when they left uh, and wrote little inscriptions inside. This is just one of the small things he would do for people. And um, as Tim Whitney said right at the end, and we all agreed, we're all of his legacy now. And it's, it's really up to us um, to, to carry on the work that, that he started and to do our best and to to keep carrying on that attitude and way of being his kindness to people. And um, I think a nice segue now into the next part that I'm gonna stop sharing, but Christina is now gonna share with us something that he was really proud of and it's his academic family tree. And he considered all of, his, all of us as his kids and something that he talked about um, a lot in, in, especially in the last couple of years. So Christina, please take it away. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I think I'm sharing my academic family tree. Can you see that? Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> so um, uh, thanks so much, Michelle. Um, I wanted to share a little bit of, about this, this academic family tree. For those of you who don't know, there is a website called academictree.org. And if you don't know about it, we invite you to take a look. And if you were one of Sam's trainees, we invite you to add yourself to this extensive family tree that you can see here. And what's cool about it is it, it tracks um, all of the trainees and, the tra and, the, and then the mentees of the trainees all the way back. And we're gonna get into some fun facts in a little while. But first I wanted to just show you here, here's Sam. Uh, he trained under Michael Phelps, Henry Huang and Harvey Hirschman all big names, but you'll see that through those names, we're connected to even bigger names, which is pretty cool. Um, but, but what's important to really note here is that how extensive Sam's family tree really is. I mean, if I scroll across, so this is Sam and these are all his children. You can see that there's even academic grandchildren here. And as I scroll across, you'll see just how extensive this tree is and how many academic grandchildren he has. Just incredible. So, so big. Um, but you'll also notice if you take a look, a deeper look, that these people are, are housed all over the place. They have their labs 
in all sorts of places. We've got King's College, we've got Cambridge, we've got Canada. Um, really incredible how extensive this is. Um, and I'm going to just, this is so big, but I'm just gonna scroll a little bit further down here because I also wanted to call attention to something really cool over here. These first graduate students. And what you'll see is these little plus signs here that pop up and show his great grandchildren, which I was, and I'm sure there's even more great grandchildren out there, but um, we invite you to make sure and help complete this family tree because it's not gonna it's not gonna be complete it's never going to be complete because we're gonna keep adding to it so that's the beauty of, of this sort of thing but he has great grandchildren in Northwestern University um, and what's what's also really neat is that it has these really interesting tools that uh, that you can uh, go in and Google in other famous scientists and see how you're connected to them. So I'm going to stop sharing. I think Christina might have frozen. So I will just say very quickly that the last time I saw Sam, he was telling me specifically about this family tree. And he had tears in his eyes, actually. He just said, Michelle, I don't know if you've seen it, but the family tree has been worked on and I have so many kids and they're all over the world and I'm just so proud of what they're doing and this is what it's all about and that's that's really um it, it just struck me and that that image will always stay with me just how proud he was um I think Christine is back now I'm so sorry <laughs> so <laughs> the, the tree like broke my internet it was so big <laughs> <laughs> Sam would love that <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um through his uh, through his uh, academic line through Michael Phelps, we're also related to Albert Einstein, seven degrees of separation from Albert Einstein, another interesting uh, scientist. We're eight degrees of separation to Thomas Edison, very impressive through Michael Phelps specifically. Then through one of his other ment uh, mentors, uh, Harvey Hirschman, we're 15 steps away from Galileo, which is incredible. He's, you know, the father of modern physics, the father of scientific method, the father of modern science. He's, I mean, that's, you know, the grand, great, great, great grandfather. Um, we're talking 1500s here, which is pretty awesome. Um, also through Harvey Hirschman, we're related to Charles Darwin, none other. So some big names that that we're, we're seeing here. I was really excited about this one because um, I'm, I'm feeling that I, I'm, I finally have a direct connection to uh, Sir Raman himself, who was the first Nobel Prize winner from India. Sam, you know, pioneered a whole new molecular imaging track using Raman spectroscopy. So uh, I'm sure he would have been really proud to know that he was related to Sir Raman himself. He also was really, um, you know, passionate about uh, the fact that, that Raman was knighted and that was one of Sam's <laughs> um great uh that's something that he really wanted was a knighthood he was like how can i get a knighthood um but <laughs> that was something that he always shared with us in our lab meetings um also through henry huang we have a relation to pierre curie responsible for the piezoelectric effect that we use in ultrasound responsible for helping discover radioactivity so that's really cool but what sam probably didn't know is that through his actual mentees through his trainees ourselves he's also now connected to really famous scientists so i don't think anybody realized that uh we are directly connected to isaac newton through his postdoc stephanie vandeven fit 13 steps because she trained under her graduate studies that went back all the way to isaac newton so now sam's connected to isaac newton through stephanie wilhelm rinkin the father of radiology, <laughs> the inventor of the X-ray, uh, David Holland, seven steps, seven degrees of separation, Henry Becquerel, also responsible for discovering radioactivity with Marie Curie and Pierre Curie, through Zen Cheng, 
his postdoc long ago. And then finally, Leonardo da Vinci, which I think is super, super cool because now we have, you know, this really famous scientist artist, none other than our, our own Preeta Ray, <laughs> who we did our postdoctoral uh, studies uh, with, 19 steps. And now we're going back to, you know, early, early times, you know, we're talking about 1400s. So anyways, I just wanted to share that. I thought that was really cool. Um, and I really encourage all of you to, um, you know, have a, a look at, at this academic family tree. And, and, it's, and it's fun to think that there might have been some sort of training style or some sort of nugget of wisdom that was passed on through all of these amazing scientists onto us. And now it's our responsibility as his trainees to carry on that legacy. So uh, thank you for you know, listening and, and please do uh, log on to the academic tree and, and add yourself there if you're not already. Okay, <clears throat> well, um, wanted to introduce myself on Atesh Parasharama. We are transitioning now to the speaker session and uh, I'm, the purpose of the speaker session right now is to illustrate the depth of and the and the breadth of Sam's uh, family tree. <clears throat> so it is my pl pleasure to introduce Sandeep Biswal, uh, professor of radiology at Stanford. He's a kind-hearted and talented physician scientist who we all know very well in the Gambier lab because of his talent as a photographer, where we often caught up with him at conferences. I often interacted with his lab in the middle of the night in the imaging facility where his students were working very hard, aiming to uh, image, um, use imaging modalities to image a process, a biological process called pain uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, and this is one of the most challenging projects for any of the faculty when I was there at the time. Sandeep is currently associate professor in the Department of Radiology at Stanford. He's co-chief of the musculoskeletal imaging uh, program and director of the musculoskeletal fellowship program. Um, he pursued his bachelor at Caltech in biology, his MD at Harvard uh, HST program in Boston. Uh, he went to Columbia for his internship, followed by his residency at Stanford uh, and his musculoskeletal fellowship at University of uh, California, San, San Diego. He's achieved uh, many awards, uh, including top abstract uh, from Moncada Award, um, Society of uh, the Moncada Award from the Society of Com uh, Computed Body Tomography and Magnetic Resonance Imaging and multiple junior faculty awards at Stanford. His laboratory, uh, which he's spending a lot of time on, aims to re uh, use uh, this concept of pain research and pain imaging to develop clinical methods that would objectively pinpoint the site of pain um, generation using novel agents and specifically seek out, seek out molecular and cellular pain markers and to highlight pain sensitive nerves. So without uh, further ado, I would like to introduce uh, and, uh, Sandeep. Thank you, Natash. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, I'm going to share my screen. All right, here we go. I was asked to uh, talk about how Sam put me on my path. Uh, Natash, it's great to see you again after so long. Um, hope you're doing well. Um, who am I? I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist, but I also had a bachelor's degree from Caltech in molecular biology. And about 2000, when I was about to become an attending radiologist, I was a hot mess. I, I didn't know what to do. I was confused how, you know, how was I going to marry my background in molecular biology with looking at x-rays and MRIs of painful joints and aching backs? And uh, for some reason, I had stumbled upon this seminal paper that Sam and Mike Phelps and Harvey Hirschman put together. And I just couldn't believe myself. I was just, wow. How do you see gene expression in a living body, right? I mean, I thought that was the coolest thing on earth. And, uh, you know, we've been doing it in cells for a couple of decades, but to actually see it in a living body was so cool. So uh, I did a dangerous thing, which is start thinking. And I, I have a clinical problem that I deal with on a daily basis, and that's trying to help people find their pain generator. So I kind of put the two together. Can you use molecular imaging to image pain? And, and of course, you know, Sam's email was listed in this article. So I just cold emailed him 
and explained, you know, how dire the pain situation was and how patients weren't getting cured and we had no drugs for pain and uh, so it just went on for a while uh, in this pretty long email. Uh, the response I got uh, from him just after cold emailing him, I have no idea who this guy is. Sounds very interesting. Call me. Uh, so I called him right uh, immediately after I got this email, which was a reply within five minutes. And anyone who's worked with Sam knows that's exactly how Sam operates, right? Very quick. Um, so I called him, and then that began this wonderful relationship that I had this with this beautiful man uh, for about 20 years. And as Natasha uh, mentioned, I I like to take pictures, and so I'm going to try to tell you this story through pictures. And here are a bunch of pictures of him over the years uh, and see how gracefully he aged. Um, uh, in this middle picture, he actually made us a meal at one of our retreats. Uh, I can't remember what it is, but it does look appetizing, and now I'm hungry. Uh, so at the beginning, you know, like I said, I didn't really know who he was. And I also realized in this point in my life, after training at, and being fortunate to train at a number of places, uh, who you align yourself with is as critical as the science behind the idea. If you don't surround yourself with good people or a good individual, then your idea is pretty much dead on arrival. So who was this Sam guy, right? And, you know, in the first few hours of meeting him and then weeks and then years, I got to learn who he is. But within a couple of weeks of knowing him, um, I got to appreciate a lot about him and learn that this is a person I want to model after. And one of the first things he did when we started discussing imaging pain was that he was a provocateur, right? Um, he would challenge you about your idea, your science, make sure you kind of know your stuff. Uh, uh, it's not lost upon me that I serendipitously captured this uh, light bulb above his head uh, as he was talking to one of his trainees. Um, challenger, he was ever the challenger, right? He would, uh, you know, uh, he had this raised eyebrow and this wide eye look. And when he did that, it was on, okay? Uh, you knew you were in for some really tough questioning and you had to be prepared. And uh, many of those discussions, I, I can't tell you how valuable they were and how much I learned from them. Uh, his arm cross pose, you know, it's about to get real. So once he challenged you and you knew your stuff, he would kind of do a deep dive and due diligence and try to help you work out what this was. And this may have nothing to do with, you know, the things that he was working on. So he would think very carefully. So he was ever the scientist trying to help you out. And then once we all kind of had a discussion, he would kind of impart his wisdom upon you and uh, tell you what he thought. Uh, he, of course, was our fearless leader, not only leading the research enterprise, but did a lot with the clinical enterprise and then at the hospital at large, as well as the university level. Uh, everyone really listened to what he had to say and then, you know, uh, st considered strongly all the things that he led us towards. He was always the motivator, right? Every time he gave a talk, I can't tell you how many times I wanted to stand up and give an ovation, you know, and I always felt sorry for the person coming after them because he knew it was going to be uh, a tough act to follow. Uh, uh, and, you know, he would always kind of give us reasons to do research, which, uh, which are always wonderful. And he was, the, you know, always, a, he had this human side to him, which I thought was also wonderful, in that he could joke around with the youngest of children. Here he is kind of joking around with his kids. And then these other pictures, he's showing uh, his lighter side, where he's a fierce, fearfully, a fierce, fiercely defending this pool from uh, unwanted invaders. Uh, once we went to, uh, he took us to Magic Mountain, which is a large park and of course in near Southern California. And uh, he showed us his daring and, and fun side. Uh, here he is taking, I think it was called the Batman roller coaster. But uh, as you can see with some of his trainees there, Zach, Andy, uh, Chris Therus, uh, uh enjoying a, a, a really scary moment. Uh, we've all talked about how much of an innovator he was and uh, just learning more about this guy and, and, and a visionary. So constantly giving plenary lectures throughout the world, sharing his vision. Uh, he's a family guy. Uh, here are some pictures with the wonderful Aruna next to him, as well as Milo. And we all know how much he loved Millen. Here he is uh, attacking Millen from afar uh, with his water gun and 
areas showcasing Millen's uh, rock star talents. And of course, his extended family with uh, molecular imaging programs, both at UCLA and at Stanford, as well as by the Department of Radiology, Amy, a number of networks and collaborations as uh, Christina was talking about has been created. And I think most importantly, he was, you know, a friend to all of us, right? He, he got to know who you were and what your, you know, issues that you were dealing with and wanted to try to help, uh, wanted to make sure you were okay. I think this is very unique for someone who's in his position. Uh, I don't think I've met anyone uh, much like that who can memorize also the names of your kids and ask them how they're doing, you know. And I think foremost uh, is that you knew he was really passionate and compassionate about the problems he was trying to solve and help those who were suffering. So just a tremendous role model, uh, very fortunate to align with him. Uh, so some of the things, uh, how I got led onto this path is that Sam would expect you to understand and be passionate about your science. He would challenge you to make sure that this is a path you want to go. And once uh, you both kind of confirmed that uh, it was you know, time to move forward. Uh, he would, one of the few people I think would take time and energy to understand your thinking and your science, uh, even if it wasn't related to what he was doing. Even this this day, there was a question he asked me in 2002, which is still a major issue for my research and we're still trying to solve that problem. Uh, before I became a part of his family, I was not even related, that's after I sent that email. He invited me to spend a year in his lab at UCLA, which I did. Uh, he called chairman at other radiology departments to find me an academic position. And then he negotiated that position in terms of protected research time and seed money. He also provided the infrastructure for success after I became part of his family here at Stanford. And he's uh, continually helped network the idea of imaging pain to a variety of academic and uh, uh, private interested parties. So how did Sam put me on his path? Uh, he was an, a tremendous mentor. He provided hope for me. He gave me protected time. He was extremely patient with me as is, uh, has been very high risk research. Uh, he gave me the confidence to pursue it and stay the course. He provided a multidisciplinary infrastructure, had tremendous resources. Uh, built a family and community for us to all thrive and served as a wonderful role model for his conviction to help those uh, uh, suffering as well as uh, your colleagues and collaborators. I just wanna say thank you to Sam and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Biswal, uh, for your very clear and, and poignant characterization of Sam Gambier, uh, the early years. Um, it was really beautiful to hear that. Um, and, and now I have the privilege to introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Adam De La Zerda. Uh, Dr. De La Zerda is now an associate professor of structural biology at Stanford. And in the spirit of the Bay Area and Stanford in particular, he also founded and now runs a rapidly growing molecular diagnostics company called Bisbee Medical. Uh, Adam was a graduate student uh, in the Gambier lab as I began my postdoc. And even among this very large group of brilliant, highly motivated trainees, I still remember how another graduate student in Gambier Lab characterized Adam. He said, Sam's lucky to have him. And I think Sam would have agreed wholeheartedly. And Adam, for his part, I think he might say he was much luckier even to have Sam. Um, and, and among his various talents, I think like Sam, you'll find Adam a particularly engaging speaker. Um, and let's now please welcome him. Thank you, so, <clears throat> thank you so much, Brian, for this uh, too kind of introduction. And, uh, and there's no doubt that the, that the honor and the, and the privilege to, uh, in, in this relationship between Sam and I was always, uh, I always felt that it was mine. Um, you know, the, the time that you spent with Sam, I, I think kind of divided, at least for me, on the pre, during, and post time in his lab. And so I thought that rather than telling you what I think of Sam, I'll let you be your own judgment of that. I'll just tell you a couple of stories about him. And, and I think in many ways, it, it's what I know those interactions that, that I carry with me now in, every, in the day-to-day -day life of, of how I conduct myself with other people, 
and and I'm certain that that in the same way that he touched me and all the other uh, mentees of his, um, we're also very much excited about passing this over and the, the things that we we encountered with him and, and loved so much to to um, to learn from him. There's something very interesting about Sam that he he was incredibly stubborn. And I remember before I decided on, on the Witch Lab to join, I was a graduate student first year. I was moving between different labs, did a few rotations. Sam was actually my fourth rotation of the year. It was really the, the last, really, you really should not be doing that many rotations typically. And I knew that I have to choose very carefully here because everything was at stake. The, the, Choosing to go into this lab versus that lab is the entire career trajectory of obviously. And I remember talking to somebody who was at the time a postdoc with Sam Shaikel, and some of you might remember him. And I asked him a little bit about him, and he told me the same thing. So let me tell you something. So Sam at the time just won a very, very large grant by the National Cancer Institute called CCNE. Uh, the Center for Cancer Nanotechnology Excellence. It's a very large grant, somewhere in the tune of about $20 million, the first CCNE. And Shai told me something that was really interesting. He said, let me tell you about how stubborn Sam is from an obviously a good point of view. He goes, when the announcement for who won the CCNE came out, uh, our name wasn't there. Sam submitted, but our name wasn't there. So it was, and Shai told me that he remembered walking into the lab that morning and looking for Sam and, and looking for Elizabeth. And I said, hey, Elizabeth, where is Sam? And her response was, well, he's in Washington, D.C. He actually, the moment the announcement was made, he took a flight. I don't think it was, people were expecting him. But sure enough, a couple of days later, he came back from Washington, D.C., and there was an announcement made that there was another grantee added, the, added there. And, and sure enough, it was the Stanford CCNU program. I remember hearing this saying, wow, that's the kind of person I want to be working with. Somebody that doesn't take no for an answer, that is so incredibly passionate about anything and everything that we're doing. Um, and then I joined this lab. And there's so many different things we can all look back and say, wow, th those are really moments where his character was imprinted on us. But I, I thought I'll show maybe a couple. The first thing was really the concept around, are you a boss or are you a mentor of mine? And it makes a huge difference, a huge, huge difference. You know, in industry, you have bosses. Very rarely do you have, do you have mentors. But in academia, you really could be both, and both, both a boss and a mentor. And you have to choose which are you. And you have to make sure that the hat you're wearing is very, very clear. And I remember with, with Sam, the context was always very clear. It was incredibly clear when you walked into his office. It was incredibly clear which hat he was wearing. And 99% of the time, he was wearing the mentor hat. In other words, he actually cared more about you than he cared about the output of the work that you're doing, than the output of the lab and the output of the field generally. Not that he didn't care about the output of the field, clearly he, he started this field, but, but it was very clear that he cares about you. And, and that really, really showed in many, many different ways. For example, he would always make sure that, that you were actually excited about the project you're doing. And he was never deceitful about it. He had a bunch of projects coming in that he wanted people to work on. A lot of people generated ideas on their own. It was always clear that if you want to work on something on your own, you'll be supportive of that. And, but in the meantime, you can get you plenty of projects going. He actually took the time to know who you are as a person and what kind of career trajectory do you look for yourself? What are you excited about? Do, would you like to be an entrepreneur? Would you like to stay in academia and become a professor? Um, would you like to go to industry? There's so many different directions there. And he knew who you are. He knew what projects were. Obviously, there were a lot of projects and a lot of people. And he did that mixing and matching in a really perfect way. I remember a lot of people coming into his office saying, I'm not going to take this project. Leaving his office saying, I can't believe I took this project and it's amazing. And again, he wasn't deceitful about this. He actually cared enough about them 
to show them the aspects of the project that they would care about, making sure that the aspects they didn't care so much for maybe were handled by somebody else. And they actually got out of it what they really wanted. And we all know how huge of a difference it makes when you have somebody working on the bench on a really hard project and things don't work and experiments fail. And what really keeps you going is that very strong notion that I have to do this. This is my choice. I want to do this. It's the right thing for me. I really care about this project. There's something greater than just right here, right now. And leaving Sam's office, even if it was just a five or 10 minute conversation, you always left his office with a very strong sense of purpose because he was full of sense of purpose. He knew who you are and you made sure to connect everything together. And that was an incredibly powerful capability. And if there's something that we're able to take away from that is that it really matters to give people a sense of purpose well above and beyond some insignificant you know, other aspects of life like salary and so on. There's something that was also very special about the one-on-one -on -one meetings that, that I've had with him. And it has to do with the fact that he was actually present. When, when you were in a meeting with him, he was with there with you. And he might have gotten 15 other emails and a bunch of other things were going on in his life. But right now he was with you and he was looking at your data together. I remember coming with prints on my laptop, we would look at it together and he was fascinated about it. And those pictures that Sandeep showed where you saw him kind of like, you know, taking his hands like this, waving his hands like this. Look at his face when he was doing like this. His face showed enormous amount of concentration. He was deep, deep, deep into whatever you told him. And he asked questions out of genuine curiosity not just to make you feel good that he's with you. He was not wasteful with his time. He was never generous in the sense that I'm giving you out of time out of courtesy. If he gave you his time, he was actually genuinely curious about it. And that, what, that is what led that conversation. And it is so much better than somebody giving a gesture and just giving you some time because then it's not, it's not meaningful. These are all sorts of things that kind of put together I think Sandeep said something really nice. Sandeep said, someone to model after. That he looked at Sam as someone to model after. I can't tell the number of times that way, way past my time in the Gambier lab, I would have asked myself about a really hard problem. What would have Sam done? And I'm not talking about a hard technical problem. Those are the simpler ones. I'm talking about a hard problem that involves people's personalities, emotions, uh, aspirations, real stuff could affect real people, including scientists as well. We're not robots. And ask myself, how would Sam figure this out? And he always had a way to make sure there's a win-win situation at the end. One of the special things about Sam is that he made this unwritten contract with you, if you will. And it was very clear that in this unwritten contract, when you spend time in his lab, you you donate your time or you contribute your ideas and so on to the lab. But once you leave the lab, Sam is with you there for life. And and so many of us I know are reaching we're reaching back to him, asking him for letters of recommendation, but far more meaningful than that, just to spend some time to get to get his advice about things. And it was always, always challenging. I remember as I was looking for for topics to work on when I started my own lab, the biggest question for me at least was what should I be working on? It's again, it's a huge decision, kind of the butterfly effect. Do I do this? Do I do that? And I remember meeting him a couple of times and he would always challenge me to the challenge me to the way that in a way that was maybe even a bit frustrating, but in a, in a positive way, where he said, Adam, you have to do something more meaningful than that. You're 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 there something, you have some some inkling of an idea there, but but think think bigger. Don't, don't, don't think at that level, think bigger. I remember I, would, I came to him with a bunch of incremental ideas and said, hey, we know how to do this, now we think we can do that. He said, no, 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 this is not, not why you're here. This is not what is gonna make a meaningful mark and you're not gonna be able to move in the way that I know you care about. You have to shoot far, far higher than that. And this is certainly something that I know I'm very, very much missing more than just about anything else, that ability to 
exchange ideas with him and and hear his voice always challenging us to do better to do greater to do better for patients first and foremost and better for the world and really believing in in patient healing um truly truly very very special human being that i know all of us here on the call on the zoom call is are are generally very much missing thanks so much adam for sharing that perspective we're really grateful um for your words um i know that uh i still remember adam as a graduate student in in our lab and um <laughs> working with him on all sorts of fun things because he had his electrical en engineering background which was so different from a lot of our more molecular cellular backgrounds but he was never afraid to dive right in <laughs> which was amazing uh, which brings us to our next speaker who is Adam Delazerda's first graduate student who recently graduated um, in the biophysics program in 2018 um, and they're at Stanford with Adam um, and his research focused on the development and application of nanoparticle contrast agents for optical coherence tomography. Um, and after completing that degree, Elliot went on to work at a, a startup, Nautilus Biotech, in research and development to help establish the next generation platform for high throughput pro proteomics. Um, he's currently a postdoc, so he's gone back to academia, academia which we're really excited about. Um, he is currently a postdoc in the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology and Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Duke, where he uses single cell multiomics and computational approaches to study different uh, or differential cell fates in Epstein Barr virus infection and virus mediated oncogenesis. And I'm really excited to introduce Elliot because I remember the first time uh, Adam got his uh, professorship at Stanford. He was so excited to recruit his first graduate student. He brought me over immediately to introduce him. And from there on, I also uh, fell in love with Elliot because he's just such a great student. And he had that same sort of enthusiasm that Adam had as a grad student. So there was definitely a common thread between Adam and, uh, and Elliot. And, and seeing what Sam passed on down through the generations. So, um, Elliot. Thank you so much, Christina, for that really kind introduction. It's, um, it's great to see everybody. And uh, I'll just, before I start, I'll share a little nugget that Christina is who I have to thank for helping me learn how to do tissue resection from mice, which ended up being super useful for my PhD project. Um, I'm really honored to have been invited to share with you my small piece of the story of Dr. Sam Gambier's mentorship legacy. Um, that story began when I met one of Sam's many gifted former trainees who you just heard from, Dr. Adam Villacerda, uh, in my first year as a biophysics graduate student at Stanford. Adam had given a guest lecture on photoacoustic imaging and optical coherence tomography in a molecular imaging class that I was taking. And I remember that he was such a compelling presenter and he was so clearly invested in creative research and innovative techniques that I was inspired to rotate in his lab. And shortly after starting my rotation, it was obvious to me that that was where I wanted to conduct my PhD project. As a mentor, Adam was incredibly supportive of me and my research interests and both my personal and professional development. And a big part of that support stemmed from his enduring ability to think positively amidst uncertain circumstances and adversity, to be persistent, and to work tirelessly to make good things happen. Now, Adam comes by those abilities by his own right, to be sure. Um, but I'm going to make the well-informed hypothesis that he refined those natural gifts by learning from and training with Sam. Um, I soon came to appreciate Sam's direct impact on my scientific training, my skill sets, and particularly the scientific environment that I got to be a part of as a trainee. When Adam first introduced me to Sam, I was struck by the precision with which he described his group's research, but more so by his ability to consistently frame that scientific detail and technicality within the broader scope of purpose to do work capable of transforming and improving patients' lives. Each time I heard him give a presentation, he always made the motivating bigger picture clear. That was the through line for Sam. And I saw how he passed it down to his trainees, 
who propagated it in their own research and work to people like me. I got to see how he passed down a belief in the service mission of academic inquiry and scientific curiosity to his son, Millen, who worked with me as a high school student for a summer research internship and who earned a co-authorship on our lab's first peer-reviewed publication. As a member of Sam's scientific lineage, I benefited from working with and being trained by investigators who likewise possessed his talents for scientific communication, creativity, and purpose-driven research. And much like Adam did for me, Sam made things happen by cultivating a scientific environment that helped his trainees succeed. I mean this not only in terms of his profound contributions to things like MIPS, the Molecular Imaging Program at Stanford, or BioX, which foster excellent research collaborations, but also quite literally to access to instruments and materials that ended up being essential to my PhD project. By providing me access to his lab's nanosite and DLS, and even the poster printer, Sam helped me to make good things happen during my PhD. He and his trainees also created an enriched atmosphere on campus that they brought with them to conferences like the World Molecular Imaging Congress, from Savannah, Georgia, to Honolulu, Hawaii, to New York City. My research experience and work, as well as the work of so many others, were made stronger because of the fruits of Sam's efforts to help establish Stanford as a force in molecular imaging research. The positive impact that Sam has had on my career didn't end when I graduated, and it continues today. His extensive contributions in molecular imaging speak for themselves, but his positive contributions to people's growth and career advancement may match and even exceed them. Without Sam's mentorship, I might not have gotten to learn from and train with Adam. I also might not have had Dr. Jesse Jokers just one building away from mine to help me get started making gold nanorods as OCT contrast agents. Nor would I have gotten to learn from Dr. Christina Zavaleta about service enhanced Raman scattering or to collaborate with her and Yas Campbell to study the biodistribution of SERS active contrast agents. And without the larger scientific environment that Sam helped build, I might not have met Dr. Parag Malik, who's been instrumental in my career and helped me branch out scientifically. These are the people who have consistently supported me and who continue to do so as I chart my career in scientific research. And Dr. Gambier's mentorship and efforts provided a foundation for those relationships. I think one of the most beautiful aspects of academic mentorship is its exponential character. Over the course of a career, one person can train many others who can in turn do the same, whether in an academic context or otherwise. And Sam's investment and dedication to rigorous, excellent training continues to make positive differences for so many of us. And as his academic grandson, I'm proud to inherit that opportunity to propagate those qualities and support to others during my career. Thanks to Sam, there are a lot of us who can do so. Thank you to the organizers of this symposium and everyone who's made this celebration of Dr. Gambier's life work and legacy possible. And thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Elliot. And those are some great um, insights into how Sam really made an impact on your research career and um, how Sam really tried to light candles that then would light more candles. Um, my name is John Ronald. I was a former postdoc fellow in Sam's lab. Um, and this next and last portion of the training session is on a video compilation of some of Sam's um, talks. Um, over the past year, a lot of us have gone back and really uh, looked at Sam's talks. And we know just such an amazing teacher being able to articulate really difficult concepts to any audience. Um, and he's really, people would become engrossed by Sam's um, talks and his ideas and just how big they were. Um, so we didn't, as Sandy mentioned, um, it's really hard to follow Sam. So we thought we would end this session um, with Sam himself um, and so this is just a short compilation of some of his talks. I, I would really encourage you to seek out some of his talks on YouTube, and we can also give you some of the links uh, for some of his full-length talks if you uh, are interested. Uh, and I just want to um, say that this was put together by the organizing committee, but a special thanks to Jim Stromer, who 
again, you heard was with Sam for 25 years. So uh, we hope you really enjoy this video and uh, thanks so much. I wanted to just make a couple of quick comments about Sam as a person as I know him. Uh, and, uh, and so I wanted to just pick a couple of ways to describe him. One is uh, excessive natural curiosity. And truly it is excessive. Uh, Sam always wants to understand how things work or he, uh, or he tries to make them work. And he is very uh, energetic in his efforts to do that. He also has the intellectual basis by which he determines when he has explored things enough. The single word is called exhaustion. <laughs> and he works through this complete exhaustion. The definition of molecular imaging could be maybe a turn off to some, but I can tell you that this is going to be as exciting as, as, as anything could be. But, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the area that's really changing the world. I think, you know, we think of these medical miracles. Wait till you see some of his pictures. And if you saw his CV and his accomplishments, you'd realize that he's on a direct pathway to a Nobel Prize. The radiology is not radiology. This is a whole area that will be integrated and probably direct medicine. Uh, his career has really zoomed, uh, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of worldwide recognition. There isn't a place I go uh, where someone doesn't know about the work that Sam Gambier is doing. Uh, and it's already been lauded by a number of very prominent awards from various professional societies, including election to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy, which is um, absolutely the most prestigious um, honor that you can get uh, when you're coming through the medical route of uh, education. So tonight, I think it's a real treat uh, to hear from Sam now. He is, I would also say, having been with him on a number of occasions, one of our most eloquent presenters. Uh, now, Sanjeev has actually accomplished a great deal in his career, having dedicated 15 years uh, to molecular imaging in cancer research. And uh, he's won several awards for this, which represent the work and dedication that he's put forward uh, in the field of uh, cancer research. So, <clears throat> in 1994, uh, after Sam had completed his MD and his PhD in biomathematics, his internship and residency in nuclear medicine, and became an assistant professor in my department, he came to talk to me. And he said that he was not sure that people would ever be interested in his work that brought together physics, biomath, and nuclear medicine. I said, Sam, <laughs> trust me. You have the ability, the imagination, the relentless drive to not only create interest in our profession, but also to build a new future for it, and you will be fine. Now, <clears throat> today, if somebody asks me who Sam Gambier is professionally, I'd say whatever the hell he wants to be. So I introduce my student, my colleague, and my dear friend, Sam Gambier. So, Let's start with what really matters, what we're taught as medical students, as young physicians, but we often forget. And what really counts is the patient. And it's not so much that our therapies, even for cancer, are um, that bad. As much as you hear about that, oh, our therapies are ineffective, they're ineffective when applied late. When they're applied early, if we could know the disease existed early, the entire equation for the progression of that disease, in this case, cancer, changes. So this is a very important motivating issue, something that makes me very angry, personally. But that anger motivates me to do something about how we're gonna take care of our children in the future and our grandchildren. It's not a surprise when we look at the data that as you back up and look at uh, you know, earlier and earlier stage tumors of many types that the survival curves quite often look like what's shown here. Uh, when you have cancers that are truly caught in stage one, two, we have much better survival rates. And yet, when we look at what's happening in this country and that matter worldwide, we're spending a hundred times more on the late stage problem. 
And this has fundamentally got to change. We in the imaging community ourselves are guilty of this because we've been afraid to tackle early detection because it is a harder problem because we'll see the numbers of cells we're trying to detect are hard. And I should also add, we're not just trying to detect all early tumors. We're trying to detect early relevant tumors, those that will go on to kill the patient. And there's a big difference because the issue is not early detection, but early relevant cancer detection. And that's what we have to remain focused on. If we try to look at what imaging is currently able to do, we're usually in the range between this 10 cube to about 1 cube. We've been able to push below the 10 cube limit just in the last few years by improvement in kind of technology, the detectors of the technologies, the imaging agents that we'll hear about. And I think we're going to start to cross through this barrier in the next few years. And going from this 1 cube barrier to the 0.1 cube, which really puts us at just a few hundred or thousand cells, requires some real innovation and luck. And hopefully, I can convince you there's something happening that will let us cross even that barrier in the years to come. As I've shown in the past, we're continuing to evolve so that we go from more and more anatomy to more and more biology. With the kind of imaging technology, including some that weren't even on this slide as it was a few years ago, that let us probe deeper and deeper at the molecular and biological level. So I always like to step back from things and say, what's wrong with the way we're doing things? And in imaging, a large group of us around the country, we're starting to ask, what's wrong with the way imaging is done? And what's wrong with it is that a lot of the images, whether they be CT, MRI, other technologies that are more anatomical in nature, you can get so much information about, let's say, a complicated city, just like the body might be viewed as a complicated city, by taking pictures from space with a satellite. And that's sort of where x-rays and CT are at. We don't really know when we look at these images what is going on with groups of cells, whether they be cancer cells or otherwise, what's going on in terms of gene expression in those cells. You're seeing the late outcome of many cells leading to changes in anatomy. And that's fundamentally a departure from an emphasis where we would like to be able to look at the cell molecular biology uh, of cancer cells while they're intact and present uh, in the living subject. Shown on the left is a blue gene that is driven by a red switch, a red promoter. And what you see is a blue protein being made. But imagine that I don't have a tracer for the blue protein. Instead of building a tracer for the blue protein, I can instead deliver a reporter gene into that same cell, shown as the red reporter gene. And now I can make red message and red protein, but I have an imaging agent for the red protein. That imaging agent for the red protein lets me indirectly infer what's going on with the blue protein. This was very intriguing to me because it freed me up from having to develop ways to do chemistry and radiochemistry. It said we could always go back and study any process in a cell by simply engineering that cell to make a reporter protein for which we already had an imaging agent. HSV1TK can be imaged by having, for example, an acycloguanosine labeled with fluorine 18 and now this fluorohydroxybutylguanine will go into a cell, will also be phosphorylated, if and only if the gene is present in that cell and is being expressed, a gene that normally would not be in your cells, and thereby, because it's trapped in the cells after phosphorylation, it would lead to signal letting you know that gene expression is occurring in that cell. One of the first things that we did was we looked at adenoviral infection within an animal model. If you have an adenovirus that carries this reporter gene and that adenovirus infects the cell, now that cell will be able to trap, in this case, an acycloguanosine, whether it be fluorine 18 gancyclovir, as we originally used, or now fluorine 18 uh, pencyclovir. We translated this tracer, Sharia Yagubi in my lab, uh, help move this tracer to humans. This is the first human that was ever imaged with this tracer. 
This is a normal volunteer working with Dr. Penuelas and colleagues in Spain, in Pamplona, Spain. We did the first imaging of adenoviral mediated human gene therapy. My lab then started to explore another optical reporter known as the Renilla luciferase, taken from a C organism, and Salenterazine. This opened up all kinds of optical imaging approaches that would then lead to a huge growth in biological models that are now commonly used for optical imaging of gene expression. Here we would fuse together luciferases, fluorescent genes, and PET reporter genes so that one combined protein is capable of fluorescing, interacting with substrates to produce light through bioluminescence, and capable of phosphorylating a PET tracer. It's actually one large protein, and the optimization of this actually took many years. This would let you go from cells to small animal models all the way to humans with a single reporter construct. Well, Joe Wu, now the head of the Cardiovascular Institute at Stanford, would apply all these approaches to looking at cardiac imaging of stem cell transplantation. We would also apply these approaches in multiple other areas in the pancreas, looking at uh, pancreatic islet transplantation. This would eventually lead to one of the most difficult trials we've ever done in humans. This trial took a decade to do. It involved the City of Hope with Mike Jensen, who's now up in Seattle, UCLA, Stanford. And it's something that I feel very proud of because we stuck with it for over a decade to bring this in. This work would now be referred to as CAR T cell therapy. What you're seeing is a PET MR where these cytolytic T cells that are marked with reporter genes are coming in, and on the left, you're seeing a lack of significant PET signal. On the right, you're seeing a lot of PET signal because now these T cells have home to the brain tumor that carry the reporter gene. These cells would nicely be visible, and we would start to understand why they're failing. We'd also start to see that the cells can move to other areas of the brain. We would also develop approaches to fundamentally hijack the splicing machinery of any cell. That split reporter would then be used to accomplish what's called complementation and reconstitution. In this way, we could monitor the machinery of any cell by looking at X and Y within a cell. And when X and Y come together, the split reporters would come together. And now the split reporters would either produce light or would be capable of phosphorylating a tracer and thereby trapping it. And finally, I hope that by the end of next year, we will have constructed this new clinic. It breaks ground in a few months. All these technologies you're hearing about, it isn't for just mice. We're going to be building clinical counterparts. Welcome, everyone, to the grand opening of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging Clinic. This is actually the second grand opening uh, since we did this last week. But uh, uh, we decided to have two open houses because we've had so many people uh, wanting to come. Um, and I appreciate all of you coming instead of going to or listening to or watching the World Series. TiVo rules. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one nothing. OK, so that's the update. one nothing. Giants are ahead. Good. I thought today I would try to take you through some of the, the generalizing principles that you know, we as a community in, in nanomedicine are learning, and then um, take those generalizing principles down to specific examples. So many, many issues, and that's what makes it very difficult to classify a given probe all the way through the process in which the FDA is used to for a small molecule or a biologics. And before I do that, you know, as a collage of these, you can see here just five electron microscopes of different modalities for which nanoparticles, or if you want to believe microbubbles fit in nanoparticles, can fit. One of the problems with quantum dots or other optical particles is the need to use light to excite them. So here the investigators are asking, well, what if you didn't need to use light? Could you have self-illuminating quantum dots? Why not have the quantum dots produce their own signal? And what you're seeing here are QDs functionalized with a Ranilla luciferase. 
and the distance between the renal luciferase and the QD is critical. And then salanterazine, which you actually have in your diets, but in low amounts in seafood, is coming in and reacting with luciferase in order to produce uh, resonance energy phenomena. And the resonance energy is eventually leading to light from the QD. The idea dates back now to the 20s with Chandrasekhar Raman and with the use now of surface enhancement Raman scattering, one can build nanoparticles in which you get intense light scattering, inelastic light scattering, so that one can amplify signal. So here's an example of a endoscope now that's been designed um, in order to be able to excite uh, the GI tract. In glioma um, surgery, it would be ideal to be able to inject a particle just once, do the MRI imaging, then during the operative setting, do photoacoustics, which gives you better depth penetration than pure optical, and then move to fine resolution removal of tumor with Raman, as well as post-removal verification that you've gotten clean tumor boundaries. So this has recently just been published and shows the ability to really combine the best of all worlds to bring together the phenomena, in this case, of MRI photoacoustics Raman for very nicely delineating tumor. And I hope that our future needs and the researchers in this audience and elsewhere are thinking more about generalizable nano platforms. So we've been studying different strategies in sound delivery to tumor sites to, in fact, allow this shedding to occur. And this seems very strange at first because you say, does that really work? And in fact, yes, it does work, but we're intercepting the same trials to actually now go in and provide sound to a region of the body to then test whether specific biomarkers increase. The heart of it is, again, really bringing engineering and medicine together. Richard Gaster, an MSTP student working between Sean Wang's lab in material science and my lab, um, was helping to develop this technology. That magneto nanoparticle now can lead to a change in magnetic field locally, and the distance between this particle and the GMR controls, in fact, that sensitive change that will lead to a voltage difference uh, in the system with the GMR. We, of course, want to develop the penultimate scanner. We want to be able to have you standing, maybe even in your shower someday, and be being scanned. We can scan your entire body and produce beautiful pictures of the anatomy of your body, the molecular signals within your body, do it at very high resolution so that we can see things. As in my own son's case, if he had been born a few decades from now, I believe that we would have much better tools for risk assessment at all stages of life. These risk assessment profiles will let us monitor each and every person in a different way. There will be enormous growth in customized monitoring. We're already seeing it in the Bay Area. Huge amount of tools that are coming up the pipeline that will be in your house, that will be on your body, that will allow us to monitor you based on your risks. That will lead then to the data analytics that will bring all this together along with the interventions that we're all used to currently. This is not precision medicine. This is precision health. How do you keep people healthy for the longest period of time instead of focusing all your energy around treating people? We've now developed an approach where you will take a pill to determine if you have an early aggressive cancer hiding somewhere in your body. This is called the early detection pill. As weird as this seems, we have proven the basics of this out in animal models, and now a company is taking this forward in humans trials. We've also recently, after five years, developed a way in which immune cells patrolling your body will generate signals when they detect early disease, including cancer. We, in fact, remove specific macrophages from you. We modify those macrophages, just like you would in an indium oxine study. But in this case, we insert a reporter that is activated if and only if the macrophage encounters or senses a tumor environment. As we've started to deploy new nanosensors in toilets, that will start to sense molecules being released in your urine that are present and let us identify early disease. We believe these kinds of in-home devices that don't force you to change your behavior 
where you can go about your normal business every day will be the secret to how we will be able to detect disease early through approaches like I'm showing you. So to end in this last 30 seconds, once this happens and once this vision comes true, all the drugs we use today, many new interventions are possible. Because it's not that the treatments are that bad, it's that they're applied too late. So that brings to end our mentee session. I wanted to thank all the mentees uh, who participated and contributed ideas. Uh, I wanted to thank all our speakers who participated today to illustrate the family tree. And uh, now we are going to go on to the uh, rest of the day. So thank you very much. And also Jim Stromer for putting the video together.